probably heard these harrowing tales about how a group of orcas since around 2020 have been attacking yachts off the Straits of Gibraltar. The behavior has baffled scientists, but it has also fascinated the public for reasons that are maybe just as baffling. But while historically orcas have never been much of a risk to people or boats, this is certainly not the first time that people have been terrorized by massive creatures of the deep. In fact, the history of whales attacking boats goes back a very long time. The ancient Greeks, Romans, and later Mediterranean peoples were all excellent seafarers, and the Mediterranean was the highway of ancient trade in the region. Despite their extensive knowledge and experience with the sea, the world beneath the waves was a pitch-black mystery, for the most part, filled with creatures they could only catch glimpses of and hiding all manner of possible dangers. The ancient Greeks called large creatures in the sea, including whales, Ketos, meaning roughly sea monster, and that term is the genesis of the modern scientific name of cetaceans. The earliest reliable reports of a whale sinking ships likely comes from the 6th century in the waters of the Mediterranean in the Bosporus Strait. Mentioned in the writings of Procopius, a historian and the most important source for the reign of Emperor Justinian I, a large whale terrorized the waters near Constantinople. Procopius says that the whale was 45 feet long and 15 feet wide, and call it Porphyrios, although the name is written in multiple similar forms. According to Procopius, Porphyrios was a terror for more than 50 years, although he seems to have disappeared for several long periods within that time. Procopius says that the whale sank many boats and terrified the passengers of many others, driving them from their course and carrying them off to great distances. He didn't focus on any particular kind of ship, sinking warships, fishing boats, and transport ships with equal fervor. Porphyrios's favorite hunting ground was the strait itself, where ships had limited mobility. Procopius claimed that Emperor Justinian himself wished to capture the creature, but that he was unable by any device to accomplish this purpose. No more detailed description of the whale exists, so it isn't clear what kind of whale Porphyrios might have been. It also isn't clear why Byzantine sailors called the whale Porphyrios. Scholars have suggested several possible etymologies for the name, including that the whale was named after a contemporary charioteer, or that it was named after Porphyrian, a giant who fought against the gods of Greek mythology. Others have focused on the name's connection to the color purple, which could allude to imperial purple and reflect the respect given to the whale, or possibly be a reference to the animal's skin color. The two most likely possibilities are that Porphyrios was a sperm whale, supported by its reported size and long life, or that it was a particularly large orca, Orcas are more common in the area, but smaller than Procopius describes. Edward Gibbon, writer of the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, wrote that the whale caused consternation for the court that followed Justinian to his summer residence at Propontis. But the huge whale's reign of terror could not last forever. According to Procopius, a large number of dolphins gathered in calm waters near the shore at the entrance to the Black Sea. Porphyrius attacked the dolphins, capturing several, but ultimately became stuck in the mud on the shore. The whale was utterly unable to escape from the shoal, but sank deeper in the mud. Seeing the whale's plight, local people rushed it with axes and hacked at it. The hacking caused little damage, but they were able to drag the whale further up the shore. They measured the great beast and finally butchered it on the shore. They celebrated their triumph over the great sea monster, but even at the time, some feared that the whale that they killed was not porphyrious at all. But if it wasn't, the legendary sea monster seems to have disappeared anyway and wasn't mentioned again. However, battles with whales are exceedingly rare for most of history, up until the period of commercial whaling, which peaked in the 19th century. Nantucket in Massachusetts was one of the greatest centers of the whaling trade and became familiar with a number of whales who became famous for being difficult to catch. Among them were Spotted Tom, Fighting Joe, Shy Jack, and Ugly Jim, but the greatest was Mocha Dick. The world was first introduced to Mocha Dick by Jeremiah Reynolds, an American newspaper editor and explorer who published an account of the whale in 1839 in the New York literary magazine Knickerbocker. Reynolds describes Mocha Dick as an old bull whale of prodigious size and strength and white as wool. Dick was a sperm whale, said to be covered in barnacles. Dick was first spotted near the island of Mocha off the coast of Chile. That's where he got his name, around 1810. A whaling ship attempted to take him, but he battled it off, the first of a hundred fights. He became famous among Nantucket whalers, who hoped to earn the honor of killing the monarch of the seas. He was said to remain docile, even swimming among whaling ships, until he was attacked, at which point he would aggressively strike at his hunters. Reynolds relates the story of a sailor who claimed to have finally killed Dick in 1838, 28 years after he first appeared. 
According to the sailor, the whaling ship took a calf and its mother before Mocha Dick came upon them, but a lucky harpoon struck deep and killed the great whale. He had 20 harpoons stuck in his hide when they butchered him. That may seem like the last of Mocha Dick, but reports continued to abound. Ten years after Reynolds' story, the Knickerbocker reported that Dick had been seen again in the Arctic Ocean by the whaler Superior. The magazine wrote that Dick had been made the depository of two or three hundred harpoons, and that the Superior chose to avoid battle with the enormous whale. Viva Mocha Dick! The whale became famous enough that he was repeatedly mentioned in newspaper. In one, the author compared a newspaper that had gone out of business, a veritable political Mocha Dick. In 1846, a fictional story in the Louisville Daily Courier included the line, I'd rather spend my life chasing Mocha Dick, the old white whale who has balked every fellow that has pulled oar after him for the last 10 years and shakes off harpoons if they were pinhooks, than play off and on with a girl that don't know her mind. In 1887, the voyage of the Fleet Wing had a character who was crippled in a battle with the terrible whale, Mocha Dick. The real Mocha Dick seems to have been busy, however, or another whale with the same name. In 1888, an old whaler reported about Mocha Dick, claiming that the whale had a career of 10 years or more, and during his time smashed a score of boats, causing the death of 25 or 30 men and carried off a boatload of harpoons. He doesn't mention the whale being white, but does refer to a sailor on the Fanny Carew, a Massachusetts whaler whose boat was smashed by Dick and who counted 22 old harpoon wounds on the Great Beast while floating beside it on an oar. The whaler contends that Dick was between 75 and 90 feet long and was never seen in the company of another whale. He describes multiple battles with the whale, including one where the whale came for the shup head on. Half a dozen ships claim the honor of finishing Mocha Dick, the whaler concludes, but I have reason to doubt that any of them were in at the death. He too reports Dick dead, but of natural causes and washed up on the island of Timor. Two years later, another whaler reported run-ins with Mocha Dick, claiming that he had a run of four years before he was killed by a Bristol whaler. An 1892 article reports a series of encounters with Mocha Dick beginning on July 5, 1840, and culminating in an ignominious death by a Swedish whaler in 1859. The article reports that Dick stove 14 boats and caused the deaths of over 30 men. Whether Mocha Dick was real or merely a legend is more difficult to ascertain, but without a doubt he was famous among whaling crews. While never confirmed by the author, the connection to Melville's Moby Dick is clear. If Melville read the report of the great white whale Mocha Dick in the Knickerbocker in 1839, it's easy to see how it might have inspired him to invent the central villain in the 1851 novel Moby Dick. It's considerably more clear, however, that another whale inspired Melville's classic novel. In 1820, the Nantucket whaling ship Essex got into a shoal of sperm whales somewhere in the southern Pacific. The ship had already had bad luck and lost two of its small whale boats, which were launched to hunt the whales. On that particular day, two of the whale boats had disappeared after harpooning whales, which then dragged the boats away on a Nantucket sleigh ride. The remaining boat was damaged in its own encounter and returned to the Essex for repairs. The crew suddenly noticed a large whale, reportedly 85 feet in length, charging the boat with tenfold fury and vengeance in his aspect. It struck the ship with its head with an appalling and tremendous jar. The whale was briefly stunned before coming around again. The second charge completely stove in her bows. Some experts since have speculated that the bull whale may have interpreted the hammering from repairs as the sounds of another male whale having invaded its territory. The men on the ship had no choice but to grab what they could as the ship sank. The other whaleboats arrived soon after, but there was nothing to do. In the three small whaleboats, the 20 crew members were left with no choice but to attempt to reach land. They were then 2,000 nautical miles off the west coast of South America. The journey back was a horrifying one. One of the whaleboats was lost with its crew, while three crew members opted to stay on the Pitcairn Islands. In a story perhaps presaging the modern attacks, one of the boats was damaged by a creature that may have been an orca, although that is far from certain. The starving crew members eventually began eating their dead, and eventually the crew drew lots to determine who would be sacrificed to feed the others. Ultimately, seven men were eaten, notably none of them eaten by whales. Only eight of the 20-man crew survived. Shortly before the release of Moby Dick in 1851, another whale sank the whaling ship Anne Alexander in the South Pacific. Two of the whale boats were hunting whales when one struck a sperm whale with its harpoon. The whale turned on them and destroyed the boat by crushing it with its jaws. Instead of leaving, another boat was lowered and they attacked the whale again. The whale destroyed a second boat. The crew returned to the Alexander and chose to attack the whale. They struck it with another harpoon and then the whale dove. 
Returned a few minutes later, moving at 15 knots, around 17 miles per hour, according to the survivors. The whale punched a hole in the ship below the waterline, and the ship began to sink rapidly. With little water and almost no food, the 22-person crew was lucky when they were saved by the whaler Nantucket two days later. When Melville heard the story, he commented, Ye gods, what a commentator is this Ann Alexander whale! What he has to say is short and pithy and very much to the point. I wonder if my evil art has raised this monster. Two more ships were sunk by whales in the first decade of the 20th century. First was in 1901, when the bark Kathleen was whaling in the South Atlantic. According to the captain, the 17th of March was one of the finest whaling days I've ever seen. Four whale boats were put down, and the Kathleen was alongside a dead whale when the captain saw a large whale, not more than 500 feet from us, coming directly to the ship. The whale attempted to go under the ship, but struck it forward at the mizzen mast. It shook the ship considerably when he struck her, and then he tried to come up, and he raised the stern. At first the ship seemed fine, but within a few minutes, water was found pouring aboard. The crew gathered provisions and got aboard the whaling ships, and the ship rolled over to windward five minutes after we got clear of her. Several of the boats were picked up the following day, while one managed to sail a thousand miles to Barbados. In 1905, the Danish schooner Anna was traveling between Iceland and New Brunswick when a whale appeared nearby. According to an account published in the Wide World magazine, the crew commented that the thing is swimming around and around as if it had suddenly gone mad. The whale swam around the ship for some time before, without the least warning, the whale came straight for the ship. It turned at the last second, but charged several more times. The captain ordered the ship to try to leave the whale behind, and the whale gave chase. With a crash that rang over the waters, the monster struck the ship, hurling the men off their feet. The whale had torn a huge hole in the ship below deck. Crewmen ran for the hand-powered pumps while the whale lay still nearby, the water becoming red with blood from its injuries. For two days, the men pumped out water, but finally were forced to launch lifeboats. Another ship found them and was able to rescue the crew. These are certainly not the only reports in history of whales damaging boats. In Moby Dick, Herman Melville mentioned the American whaling vessel Union, which sank in 1807 after accidentally running into a whale. The Australian bark King Oscar was rammed and damaged by a sperm whale between Hobart Town and Newcastle in 1871. The U.S. National Marine Historical Society notes on its webpage that in 1849, off the coast of Nicaragua, a ship named the Frederick sank after a collision with a whale. In 1850, in the midst of being hunted, a sperm whale rammed a hole in the hull of the whale ship Pocahontas, forcing the ship to run to safety into Rio de Janeiro. And the same year, the whale ship Parker Cook was twice hit by an enraged whale, yet managed to float to safety. Still, whales attacking ships is extremely rare behavior, and experts emphasize that sperm whales are not aggressive, more or less vindictive, and modern steel-hulled vessels are generally impervious to even the largest of whales. In fact, the risk is very much more on the other side. Experts estimate that some 20,000 whales are killed every year after being struck by ships. Not to mention the three million or so that were killed by whaling over the period of the 18th through the 20th centuries. And as to the current trend of orcas attacking boats off of the Iberian Peninsula, the general public reaction seems to be in favor of the orcas. People apparently seeing some sort of poetic justice in these whales attacking expensive yachts. The behavior, however, still has baffled scientists, but really it might just be the, the same way that the ancient Greeks or Byzantines saw it. Maybe these attacks simply represent the enormous power of the ocean, which despite millennia of effort, humans have yet to conquer. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.